Hello. I'm sure that, like me, you have been filled with awe and admiration as London's Excel Centre, Birmingham's NEC, or Manchester's GMEX have been turned into Nightingale hospitals, as the way high-speed trains have become ambulance ones, and at the rapid evacuation of desperately ill patients via helicopters. And above all, I am sure that you have marvelled at the dedication of the nurses. Historians love finding parallels between past events and what is happening in the present. So I thought that for this week's fireside or Corona chat, I'd tell you a little bit about the ways the overstretched nursing and medical services of the Great War coped with the overwhelming numbers of patients and lack of facilities, about how quickly technology evolved and how some very unlikely venues became state-of-the-art hospitals, and also pay tribute to those who, like the amazing nurses who are working flat out today, found unimaginable endurance, courage and professionalism. So, let's begin on the 18th of August 1914, when 24 highly trained members of the Queen Alexandra's Imperial Military Nursing Service set sail for France. None, probably like the nurses today, could have imagined the long emotional and physical journey they and the many hundreds of others who followed in their wake were embarking upon. Hardly had the nurses arrived when things began to go drastically wrong militarily. Between the 23rd of August and the 5th of September 1914, the British army that had set off for France so full of confidence was in headlong retreat from Mons. But it wasn't only the army that was in retreat, so too were the nurses that had so recently been advancing with them. The sufferings of the wounded in the precipitous retreat gave 42-year-old Kate Luard, a veteran of the early 20th century South Africa wars, cause for anxiety. She tells us that men were picked up without a spot of dressing on any of their wounds, which were septic and full of straw and dirt. Sister Millicent Peterkin gives us a sense of the desperation to evac both evacuate both the wounded and their field hospitals in the face of the advancing enemy. Loaded onto troop trains accompanied by sisters, the wounded were lying eight or nine in each truck and in beside each lot were two sisters. They had had to abandon 700 beds, all their tents and equipment and all personal belongings, having nothing but what they stood up in. Such mass rapid evacuations in the face of an advancing enemy would, at least until March 1918, soon become a thing of the past, as the Western Front, at least, settled down into its four-year stalemate of trenches and mud. So, perhaps this is a good idea, good time, to give you a brief outline of the soldier's journey from being wounded to arriving, hopefully, in hospital. Part two. The journey begins. A soldier's first contact with the medical services was via regimental first aid posts. These, as the name implies, merely provided basic first aid. From these, the wounded were transported, initially by horse-drawn ambulances, subsequently motorised ones, which were often driven by women. They were driven to advanced dressing stations, which were frequently overwhelmed, particularly during big battles. Once again, there was little sophisticated about the care and men were moved as quickly as possible, often to casualty clearing stations or CCS as they were known, which were frequently under canvas or perhaps in flimsy huts. These were staffed by professional nurses, as well as doctors and surgeons, and this was a man's first opportunity to be operated upon. As casualty clearing stations were still situated quite close to the front lines and often railway ones, they were liable to bombardment. An Australian nurse, May Tilton, remembered how, with bombs raining down, the surgeons worked on as calmly and as quietly as though the menace in the sky did not exist. When the bombs exploded, we breathed a sigh of relief that the operating tent had escaped and our work could go on. As casualties increased exponent, exponential, exponentially, so too did the CCS in both numbers and size. Some covered well over half a mile. Nurses, as their diaries demonstrate, 
were often literally rushed off their feet. As well as permanent staff that were often on site from, for six months with barely a day off, there were also groups of, star, of staff designated for teamwork. Teams consisted of one surgeon, one anaesthetist, one sister, two orderlies, and rather bizarrely, the officer's Batman. They would move as rap rapidly as conditions allowed between different CCSs wherever the need was greatest. Forerunners of today's rapid response teams, they were used to working together and re could respond seamlessly. They would spend somewhere between 24 and 48 hours at one CCF, with staff often snatching what sleep they could as the ambulance sped to respond to the next May Day call. Beatrice Hopkinson served on one of these teams, writing graphically in her war diary of her arrival at one CCS. Never will I forget the sight that met our eyes. There was a constant stream of patients coming in with nowhere to put them. Marquees were being put up everywhere and stretchers taken in with the patients lying on them, their bandages bloodstained. Hundreds of milder cases were lying about in the open, getting what attention they could. Everybody was rushing about and the place was in absolute chaos. It seemed to me that I was right on the battlefield. It was terrible to see those poor boys limping about, helping themselves as best they could. Some had fractures and their wounds were all oozing. The sisters were busy in the wards with more serious cases and the orderlies were rushing here and there, trying to erect shelter for the night or carrying food to the patients. There was a constant stream of patients being taken to the theater for operation by the stretcher bearers and another stream of patients that had been operated on leaving by a side door for the wards. Rolling up her sleeves, Beatrice and her team set to work wherever they were needed. The aim was to keep patients for as short a time as possible in a CCS. Then, as soon as it was safe to do, them, do so, move them further back the lines, generally on ambulance trains or even barges. To her delight, Kate Luard, who we met on the retreat from Mons, was soon detailed for duty on an ambulance train. On the 27th of September 1914, she excitedly wrote a, le a letter home. Did you ever know such luck? Part three, evacuation. Kate's initial experience when she took the 480 sick and wounded on a train which was miles long may have fired her for enthusiasm for this very novel modern nursing experience although initially the trains were hardly fit for purpose. She explained how, you boarded a cattle truck, aimed with a tray of dressings and a pail. The men were lying on straw. They had been in trains for several days. Most had only been dressed once and many were gangrenous. No one grumbled or made any fuss, more ghastly than anything I have ever seen or smelt. Her colleague, Louisa Bickmore, expresses similar sentiments. No tongue can tell what these patients have gone through, and none who have not seen them in their battle dress can form any conception of it. I might add that in their wonderful letters and diaries, Beatrice, Kate, Louisa, and countless other nurses are, in fact, pretty successful at describing all they saw and felt. Initially, the train's facilities for patients and staff on the generally about 42-hour journey if there were no delays and troops being moved up the line, always had priority over the wounded being moved down the line, the conditions were primitive. I wonder if those working on trains evacuating COVID-19 patients might share this sense of being squashed in that nurses and patients experienced on the 1418 equivalents. Of course, no Brit can survive for long without a cuppa, so nurses made tea in cans using the engine's water. As the early ambulance trains had no corridors, ignoring official prohibitions, nurses clambered from coach to coach while in motion by way of the footboard, wearing, of course, ankle length skirts. In addition, they carried a load on their backs. The load was a bag, as aseptic as possible under the conditions, which contained dressings, medicaments, etc. And in addition, during the night, when going from one coach to another, Kate tells us how the sisters had to carry hurricane lam lam lanterns suspended from their arms. It is needless to say what dangers we are exposed to, but we are fulfilling our duty. 
Kate was proud of her expertise at clawing along the footboards. Although this was forbidden, the Army nurse's matron-in-chief, Maud McCarthy, usually a stickler for nursing, nurses obeying rules, even condones her staff contravening the interdiction on changing coaches. After all, she explained, and perhaps mirroring so many of today's nurses' disregard for their own personal safety, they could not do otherwise knowing that men on each coach might perhaps be dying for want of attention. With the passing of time, such acrobatics became a memory. Purpose-built trains had corridors and stretcher racking, but life on board could be hazardous, as despite the prominent Red Cross, ambulance trains suffered bombardment. More than one ambulance train sister was awarded the military medal for gallantry during these raids. Then, as now, Nearly all nurses considered their first duty to be their patients. Beatrice succinctly sums up her reactions after an air raid. I never realised what the word duty meant until this war. To stand at one's post, never flinching, and trying to keep the boys cheerful, all the time wondering when our time would come. At times my knees just shook, and had I allowed it, my teeth would have rattled but I had to be brave for my patient's sake. Sadly, not an insignificant number of nurses, including Beatrice's own matron, fell victim to shell shock and post-war spent several years in an asylum. We can only hope that COVID-19 nurses, that COVID-19 will not destroy the mental health of this generation of dedicated nurses. If today's helicopters and TGVs and the Great War's ambulance trains were intended to move patients quickly, one form of transport was chosen because it was so slow. These were the hospital barges, which from September 1914 plied up and down northern France's extended waterway system, carrying the most severely wounded patients, whose lives depended on being jolted as little as possible. It is almost miraculous that many survived the embarkation process, which involved being lowered by ropes and pulleys, often worked by the barge's cook. They went through the opening top of the barge to the wards below. Despite these apparent shortcomings, the nursing and popular press extolled the virtues of this mode of transport, which is the most ideal means of conveying wounded, as, although it may be slow, wounded men are in no hurry and can be as well and economically attended to on these barges as in hospital tents. It was lucky they were in no hurry, as bad weather could delay journeys by as much as 42 hours, putting additional pressure on the two sisters, nine Royal Army Medical Corps orderlies, and the one medical officer who was shared between barges, which were towed in pairs. Although patients might have been in no hurry, barge sisters, as they were called, like all World War I nurses and like our corona ones, faced long and exhausting days. In a letter home, Millicent Peterkin explains, I'm going to bed now, as I wasn't in bed until 3.30 this a.m., and I was up again at 8. By now, it was not only physical tiredness which was the enemy. Although barges were painted grey with the Red Cross prominently displayed on each side, they became a target for fighter pilots, with lights turned off at night, Nurses made their rounds in the pitch dark, a small torch, the only means of light. Although nurses' letters were, like those of soldiers, heavily censored, hints of the conditions can be gleaned. They were constantly begging folk at home for comforts for the men in their charge, as well as some rather surprising necessities. One nurse pleaded for the abrasive cleaner, Vim, whilst Millicent Peterkin longed for a simple pudding recipe book as on her barge at least, the cook was either unimaginative or unskilled when it came to puddings and could only produce sago or stewed fruit. Difficulties of life on board extended beyond needing vim, recipes, or even nursing men who were frequently more dead than alive. Some of the barges were barely fit for purpose. One sister reported, a barge became more and more leaky until we simply paddled from bed to bed, and then we had to lie up for repairs. In winter, slippery decks meant some nurses taking an unexpected dip in the freezing canal, and many took to crawling along the decks on a rather undignified all fours. In addition to their nursing duties, when patients were offloaded, 
cleaning with or without vim was undertaken a demanding and essential task as soldiers could be evacuated straight to the barge from the battlefield as opposed to via a dressing station they were often filthy and lice ridden and when they had been gassed poor barge ventilation meant that other patients and staff would suffer a mild gas attack which could lead to breathing problems and worse whilst they ran the risk of being bitten by, li by lice which could lead to the nurses developing typhus and trench fever. Interlude, part four, fashioning personal protective equipment. I expect some of you read Apple's CEO Tim Cook's tweet about Apple having sourced over 20 million masks and how the company's design engineering, operations and packaging teams were working with suppliers to design, produce and ship face shields for medical workers, not to mention the Dutch company whose diving equipment is being used on the COVID front line. This reminded me of two women's imaginative fashioning of personal protection, not against de disease, but the dreaded gas. I'll briefly tell you the story. In late April, 1915, Two volunteers with the first aid nursing yeomanry were working with the Belgian army near Hellfire Corner on the Ypres Menin Road. Woken by the sound of firing, soon everyone began to cough and choke. In a description predating Wilfred Owen's 1917 about gas, Dulce et decorum est, one of them wrote, out of the queer green haze that hung over everything, came an unending stream of soldiers, stumbling, staggering, gasping, all a livid green colour. It was the first gas attack. A high-ranking British officer asked the women for details of the respirators used, issued by the Belgians and the chemicals they contained, and whether we considered them effective at any distance from gas. Presumably, the two women did not div divulge that they had resorted to fashioning relatively efficient gas masks for themselves out of Mr. Southall's hygienic towels for ladies. These, of course, in themselves were a novel invention as they only dated back to the 1890s. I'm sure you will be pleased to hear that eventually masks were, were made available to nurses. Having no known remedy for a ghastly Ill illness other than palliative care and skilled nursing, is a scenario with which we are currently horribly familiar. So too with the after effects of gas poisoning from which nurses also suffered after close contact with, pa with patients. The Army's matron in chief Maud McCarthy describes a scene which must have closely resembled one from Dante's Inferno. Every effort made seemed of no avail to, reveal, to relieve the sufferings of the patients. Every conceivable remedy was tried, even to the administration of chloroform. The staff worked almost unceasingly, 20 hours on end, but could see little result for their work. The hospitals at Bayeul were full, the grounds were full, the fields around were full of patients gasping for breath, shouting out for drinks, and unable to lie still on their stretchers. It was a dreadful experience for all. Part five, life on the ocean waves. Like the army, the Royal Navy had its own nursing service and a significant number of nurses served on hospital ships. Some were purpose built. Others, such as the Titanic sister ship Britannic, were rapidly converted. Joining her sister ship on the seabed, Britannic was sunk on the 16th of November, 1916. Proving some people are born under a lucky star, volunteer nurse and former Titanic stewardess Violet Jessop, dub, dubbed Miss Unsinkable, now survived her second shipwreck. It is of course easy nowadays to forget that every wounded man who was evacuated to England was transported by ship. For some patients and nurses, this was a long, arduous and at times perilous voyage. Several Royal Navy nurses have left fascinating accounts, including Anna Cameron, 
who served on His Majesty's hospital ship Delta, within sight and sound and range of the guns of Gallipoli. On the 8th of May 1915, she and her colleagues used field glasses to observe the land battle, whilst anxiously awaiting the inevitable harvest of wounded, which on this day consisted of 400 horribly wounded men straight from the field. Some were fought, shot further in the boats which took them to us. The gangway ran with blood. Some of the poor fellows hadn't had one dressing on. One needed all one's common sense and courage. We, three sisters, had 200 of the wounded, and we only had six as opposed to the normal 45 orderlies at that time. So many were needed for stretcher bearers. The wounded were so deadbeat that we wrapped them in their filthy clothes, poor fellows, and let them rest. Faces shot away, arms, legs, lungs, shots everywhere. One said, thank God we have the sisters. Having returned to England with her cargo of suffering humanity, Delta and Anna were soon back in the Dardanelles, where we saw the long line of stretcher bearers dashing along to the shore and the boats put off thick and fast. Our turn soon came. With 1,240 men on board a ship staffed for 487, Delta again set sail. In her diary, Anna confesses, the hopelessness of struggling against heavy odds and unable to relieve suffering adequately tries me so dreadfully. The other sisters seem to keep calmer inside. I can't, if only I could. By the 29th of November 1915, her need to abandon the dying to attempt to minister to the still just living is torturing Anna. The memory of some things which have often led, had to be left undone in the stress of war nursing, stabs and stabs in the quiet days. Part six. Necessity is the mother of invention, general hospitals. Just as has, as has happened today with our Nightingale hospitals, Hospitals were springing up in every theatre of war. Some were tented, others established in huts, casinos, sports stadia, amusement parks and hotels. Let me tell you about one rather unusual one, as it was founded, funded and staffed by women. Its story starts on the 15th of September 1914, when doctors, Louisa, daughter of England's first female medical doctor, Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, and Flora Murray arrived in Paris with their newly established Women's Hospital Corps. They had been invited by the French Red Cross to run a hospital for the woefully stretched French medical services. Had they known what awaited them, they might have felt daunted. Or maybe not. They had been told that their hospital would be in the magnificent, recently commandeered Hotel Clarige on Paris's famous Champs Elysees. Well, Clarige might have had a prestigious address, but it had little else to recommend it as a hospital. Maybe those who worked day and night transforming the XL, NEC and GMEX may have felt the same way. Flora described their new quarters as a gorgeous shell of marble and gilt without heating or crockery or anything practical. Nevertheless, they set to work. Within days, the hotel was transformed. Once a gas steriliser and powerful electric lights were installed, the Lady's cloakroom, with its pavement, its hot water supply and basins, was converted into the operating theatre. Having been passed as fit for pur purpose, Clarige was soon admitting horrifically wounded British as well as French personnel. Chief Surgeon Louisa and anaesthetist Flora proved, to the medical military authorities' amazement, every bit as competent as male medics. Clarige, indeed, soon had the reputation of being one of the foremost military hospitals in France, taking in ever more seriously wounded casualties. One of their nurses, Amelia Miles, remembered how poor men, terribly wounded, were brought, most of them from the trenches, without even a field dressing. The hospital was so successful that Flora and Louisa were told that they had set a standard which is quite unknown. <laughs> 
you are such a good example of what a hospital ought to be. In February 1915, deeply impressed by the WHC's work in Paris, British Surgeon General Sir Alfred, Alfred Kyo, who had originally turned his nose up at the women doctors, asked them to take charge of a hospital of 1,000 beds in Endell Street near Covent Garden. They now had to set to to convert an old workhouse into a hospital that took in some of the most severely wounded casualties from the Battle of the Somme. Known as the Suffragette Hospital, that will have to be a story for another day. In a now familiar scenario, demand for hospital beds soon outstrips supply, and so multiple venues, suitable and less so, were rapidly transformed into makeshift hospitals. Let me tell you about two of them. I'm sure that many of you enjoyed the ITV series Downton Abbey, and you might remember the episodes relating to Downton as a war hospital, as well as those dedicated to another pandemic, the so-called Spanish flu. Well, the real, real life Downton Abbey, Highclere Castle, did indeed serve as a war hospital. Nowadays, it does seem strange that society ladies the length and breadth of the UK were converting their stately piles into war hospitals. But that was indeed what was happening. And Lady Almina, fifth Countess of Carnarvon, Doyen of Highclere, was no exception. Practiced in getting her own way and never one to take no for an answer. By the 12th of August, 1915, she had enthroned the family's personal physician as medical director. A team of 30 nurses, boasting high fashion uniforms in a cheerful crushed strawberry print with white aprons and caps, all paid for by Almina, swiftly followed. A first floor bedroom was transformed into an operating theatre. Guest bedrooms became individual, or at the most, twin bedded hospital ones, and the servants' quarters were largely turned into nurses' accommodation. Reception rooms became day rooms where the men would be made to feel like guests. The walking wounded's meals were even served to them by footmen. In mid-September 1914, Highclere's first patients were welcomed. Somehow admitted seems the wrong word. The soldier who commented that he felt as if he had arrived in paradise must have voiced the feelings of all patients or guests, as Elmina preferred to call them. But Highclere was more than both a luxurious venue and a drain on her eye-wateringly wealthy father, Alfred de Rothschild, himself a long-standing treasurer of Queen Charlotte's hospital's purse. She also ensured that she had the most up-to-date equipment and professionals working for her. By 1916, Almina felt both the need to expand her premises and ready to take on a greater challenge, and she secured the lease on 48 Bryanston Square in London's exclusive Mayfair di district. Highclere's nurses and many of its patients was transferred, and Highclere settled down, if not into its pre-war splendour, then something a little closer to its intended purpose as the embodiment of luxurious living. If few surroundings could have been more luxurious than those at Highclere, none were surely more exotic than those of another venue that was reinvented as a hospital, the Royal Pavilion Brighton, the holiday home. I hope you can hear the inverted commas of England's playboy, Prince Regent, subsequently King George IV. This was quite simply an extravaganza of towers and minarets that bore a close resemblance to a Maharaja's palace and unwittingly anticipated its initial wartime occupants. Neither its architect, John Nash, nor his royal patron could have conceived the role the pavilion will play some 120 years after its completion. As with Highclere, let's focus on the first two years of the war, 1914 to 1916. Most people are aware of the enormous contribution made to the British war effort by forces from the Canadian, Australian, New Zealand and South African forces. Less well known is that made by those from the Indian subcontinent. The Indian Army provided the largest number of troops, and by the end of 1914, they made up almost a third of the British Expeditionary Force. Between, late, between 1914 and late 1915, they served on the Western Front 
suffering the same horrendous physical and psychological wounds as their European counterparts and needing evacuation back to England. Brighton was chosen as the site for a complex of military hospitals dedicated to the care of wounded and sick Indian soldiers. Three buildings were given by the town authorities for this purpose, including the Royal Pavilion. Once again, mirroring the achievements of those who have transformed the exhibition centres into Nightingale hospitals, in less than two weeks, the pavilion had been reinvented as an enormous medical facility. Along with new plumbing and toilet facilities, 600 beds were set up in what were really exotic looking wards. X-ray equipment was installed and the great kitchen became one of two operating theatres. The pavilion's first patients, who arrived in early December 1914, were followed by over 2,300 others. The powers that be showed a surprising awareness of Indian casualties' cultural needs. There were separate water supplies for Muslims and Hindus. Nine kitchens were set up in the grounds so that food could be cooked by the patient's co-religionists. A makeshift Sikh temple was erected in the pavilion grounds and Muslim, Muslims were given space on the eastern lawns for prayers. In late 1915, the patients were moved from the so-called Dr. Brighton to the Lady Hardinge Hospital at Brockenhurst. She engaged 17 nurses who, to their patient's delight, spoke Hindustani, including a keen photographer, one Hilda Hand, who you can see photographed with her patients. The pavilion's hospital days were far from over when the Indian troops moved out. In April 1916, it reopened as a hospital for British amputees. It treated over 6,000 soldiers who had lost arms or legs, sometimes both, during the war. Rehabilitation was a high priority, with attempts to ensure that men had skills to help them cope in the post-war world. The pavilion remained open until 1919. One more of the multiple buildings pressed into medical service in an extraordinary moment in our recent history. Of course, when war or disease sweep the land, medical emergencies cannot be put on hold. And so I thought I would end this talk by telling you about an extraordinary facility established close to the front line by the Quaker War Victims Relief Committee. Part seven, life goes on. In November 1914, two Quakers, Dr Hilda Clark and her companion, midwife Edith Pye, arrived in chalon sur marne in northeastern France, determined to alleviate the suffering of the refugees who were pouring in from the surrounding areas as the Germans occupied their villages. Many of the women were pregnant and maternity care was urgently needed. Hilda and Edith persuaded, and these two women were nothing if not persuasive, the mayor to provide them with maternity facilities. He made over a wing of the Asile des Vieillards, the home of what Edith termed the aged, the imbecile and the ep epileptic. In Edith's words, it was a gaunt building permeated by that indescribable horror, the institution atmosphere. It boasted stone floors, an uncertain water supply, insufficient oil lamps and totally inadequate stoves, which failed to heat. Its huge windows and complete lack of cellars did not bode well should Chalon find itself in the firing line. Edith tells us again that putting this out of our minds, we began scrubbing beds, bedding and woodwork, assisted by some of the imbeciles which did not naturally prove to be efficient aid. By St Nicholas's Day, the 6th of December 1914, Edith considered this an auspicious beginning. The ward was up and running and on the 9th of December 1914, one Marie-Louise was born there. She was able to write by the time her mother and six elder siblings returned to their home in what had been the occupied zone in 1919. Although air raids became a dreaded part of life, in July 1917, intelligence indicated that the Germans were preparing a massive bombardment of Chalon. As the small matter of a town being bombarded does not stop babies arriving, it was time to think laterally. As Chalon is in the Champagne producing area of France, there was a network of underground cellars, which 
just like the London tube stations in both world wars, were already being used as air raid shelters. Edith set up shop, so to speak, in one of these. She described her state-of-the-art maternity facility to which she descended every night. Inside, it is as black as pitch, and I light a torch and pick my way to the little corner reserved for me, a quaint shelter railed off from the public gaze by tarpaulin on a wooden frame about eight feet by six feet and eight feet high. The bedstead is already there. Being iron, it cannot absorb the damp and soaks everything. Every night on arrival, you make the bed and put in the hot water bottles, set out the lanterns with their legend, Maternité Poste de Secours, and then wander back to see what the rest of the world is doing. Suddenly, you are surrounded by an anxious voice, Maternité, s'il vous plaît! In two minutes, the patient is installed in the bed. Eventually, a new sound joins all the others in that curious medley, the indignant wail of a newborn who finds the cave, the cave or cellar quite horribly cold and damp. The vision conjured up by this narrative reminded me of my 2017 visit to the demilitarized zone in Vietnam, where North Vietnamese took shelter in a complex network of tunnels with ledges carved out of the rock. One such had a mock-up of the maternity services. A local woman proudly told me that her uncle was one of the dozen or so North Vietnamese babies who first saw the light of day some 20 meters underground in this tunnel. Whenever I'm in the Chanel area of France, I wonder if my path has crossed with descendants of those champagne cellar babies or of the 981 infants delivered by Edith Pye. Edith was one of the few women to be made a Knight of the Légion d'Honneur for her bravery and services to humanity, a service which would continue in starving Central Europe long after the guns fell silent and the babies returned to their homes in now liberated Northern France. I do hope you have enjoyed hearing about this generation of approximately 24,000 professional nurses, assisted by an army of volunteers who I haven't had time to mention, whose active service between 1914 and 1919 involved caring for the occupants of the 637,746 hospital beds at home and in all theatres of war, not to mention the 900 nurses who served on the hospital ships which evacuated and treated the, the wounded. A sad statistic is approximately 1,500 professional nurses from Great Britain and her dominions and 500 volunteer nursing and ancillary staff lost their lives as a direct result of their war service. They found the inner strength which enabled them to work in hitherto undreamed of conditions and circumstances. They took their professional skills to new unimagined heights. I feel sure that they would salute those who are following in their footsteps, creating medical facilities in the most unlikely places and doing battle, not this time against war wounds, but against the worst pandemic we have seen in a hundred years. The words the soldier spoke to the naval to naval nurse Anna Cameron on His Majesty's hospital ship, ship Delta a century ago still ring true. Thank God we have the nurses. <laughs>